For the Patrick family of York County, Virginia, hunting waterfowl is an integral part of their family legacy. Passed on through the generations, this time-honored tradition has been a constant source of pride and sustenance for the Patrick family. Frank Patrick began hunting in the early 1930s. I did enjoy duck hunting when, when uh, I was coming along in the 30s and 40s, that uh, it was a very common thing to, uh, to do uh, at that time, and it uh, wasn't so much a sporting event at that time as it was uh, hunting for uh, uh, food on the table. For the next generation of Patricks, Frank passed his knowledge on to his son, David. I had David out uh, uh, duck hunting and goose hunting. When I say early age, probably at about four or five. And uh, from that point on, uh, uh, David uh, was a very enthusiastic duck hunter. Uh, I hate to admit it, but uh, he became very good and probably almost as good as his dad. Working as a paramedic in the fire department, David meets fellow duck hunter Pat Humphreys. Very passionate about duck hunting. I uh, started when I was a little kid, about five years old with my father. He used to take me out on Back Bay in Virginia Beach. So I've always grown up around hunting, duck hunting and deer hunting. But I think I really like duck hunting a lot better. It's just out on the water. It's, uh, I've just always done it all my life. It's a chilly December morning when David and Pat set out accompanied by David's trusted dog, Katie. We were real excited about the day because it was going to be sleeting and possibly snowing and the wind was going to be blowing strong. So everything to make up for a really good duck hunting day. As a successful day winds down, the evening brings stormy winds and low tides, so low that the boat becomes beached on a sandbar. After David and Pat manage to free the boat, they immediately head towards the mainland. As we're going out into the bay, um, we noticed that there was some water in the bottom of the boat. And before you knew it, it was up on our ankles and kept continuing to get deeper. As the boat begins to capsize, the firemen make a split-second decision to dive into the icy water. When we dove into that water and we went underwater, not knowing if we're going to come up, that'll never leave my head. When they do emerge unharmed, David and Pat find themselves in a desperate situation. I think uh, everybody was thinking the same thing that we had to get from underneath or from around this boat, or we would be caught underneath it and, and drowned. We saw the dog only for a short period of time, and then we have no idea where the dog went. And at that point, we were by the boat, and very cold, um, scared, didn't know what was going to happen. As the rush of freezing water initiates the effects of hypothermia, the men have little time to decide on a course of action. We really were disoriented. All we knew was we had to be able to alert somebody to we were capsized. David suddenly remembers a set of flares stowed underneath the boat. It is an incredibly dangerous move to dive under the boat and risk being entangled in the web of decoy line. Yet without any other signaling device, the flares may be their only chance. As David dives down under the boat, Pat realizes he might not re-emerge alive. I think the biggest fear is that that we were going to die, that we were going to drown or freeze, fall asleep, not wake up before anybody came out there to get us. Duck hunters David Patrick and Pat Humphreys have capsized their boat. As hypothermia quickly sets in, all hope falls on a desperate attempt to recover a set of flares from underneath the disabled boat. David went underneath the boat, um, 
to get to try to find the flares. And we weren't really that thrilled with him going underneath the boat. But I think at that point we knew we had to do something to try to alert somebody that we were out there. As David amazingly emerges from the water with flares in hand, the next step is to find land and signal for help. At that point, we had no idea where we were at. Luckily, we were near a refinery that has a large flame on a tower that burns 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we saw the flame in the distance, and that was basically the only way that we knew which direction the Marsh Islands were. After a half hour of swimming, David and Pat finally make it to dry land. Though they are significantly relieved, they are still miles away from the mainland and only a few degrees from severe hypothermia. You know, you're out there cold, feel sleepy. You know, all I felt like is just want to go to sleep and just wait. But we knew we couldn't go to sleep because if you go to sleep, you, know, you might not wake up. Meanwhile, back on the mainland, David's father, Frank, is growing increasingly concerned with the lateness of the hour and the absence of his son. He heads down to the dock, only to find David's truck and trailer still there. Frank quickly contacts the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. I made some phone calls. I called the U.S. Coast Guard. I called the York County Fire Department. I also called Virginia Marine Resource Commission, and they got people on the waterway with their boats in the actual rescue mode. As a rescue team is being assembled, a Coast Guard ship spots a flare on the water. It might be David and Pat. Unfortunately, the waters are far too shallow for the massive ship to investigate. The Coast Guard makes a decisive call to Charles Leftwich and the York County Fire Department in hopes that their pontoon boat can quickly locate the source of the flare. The night was really bad. It was uh, dark, very dark, no clouds. It was sleeting and spitting snow and uh, it was really rough, a lot of winds. Amazingly, the fire department finds David and Pat. They are extremely cold and exhausted, but alive. They are immediately rushed to an ambulance on the mainland. Though they have just survived an incredible ordeal, the only words David can utter are those of remorse over the loss of his beloved dog, Katie. She was really a, just my best friend. We, we did, she would go everywhere with me. Um, we spent a lot of time together. I was at a loss. I didn't know, you know, what's, it's, how do you describe losing your best friend? The next day, David and Pat head back out on the water in a seemingly hopeless attempt at finding the lost dog. Pat and I went back out to find Katie, and we discussed going out there, where should we go first, where should we look for her? I could see the boat off in the distance, the, uh, the overturned boat off in the distance, and I said, let's go to the boat first. And as we got closer, I saw movement on the boat. And uh, I got a little closer, and I knew it was Katie, and I was, I was thrilled. She's okay. She's alive. Today, David continues the family tradition. Though his love for duck hunting has not been deterred, a new sense of caution pervades. I could have done many different things that night. Um, one thing that we that I started doing is whenever there is any weather whatsoever, uh, any wind, any 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 um, uh, rough weather at all, everyone in the boat puts on a life jacket. Um, immediately. As major factors in his survival, David credits his training as a paramedic and the motivation of spending time with future generations of Patrick's. The night that we turned over, turned the boat over, was my daughter's birthday. It was her eighth birthday. And I had promised Kelly that I would be, at seven o'clock, I would be there for dinner. I thought about that that evening. Um, I thought about being with my daughter that evening. And also, I have been in situations that were um, that seemed hopeless, that seemed helpless before, and I knew that um, that if we just kept working at it, things would um, that we would be okay. 